I'll share a little bit about myself. Um, as some of you know that are here with us most every week, my name is Mara Walsh and I am in the United States, uh, specifically between Philadelphia and New York. So I'm on the East Coast and it's East Coast time. I started leading physical tours with EF Tours as a Girl Scout leader, uh, taking girls and their families to international destinations every summer. I have since expanded my travel program. I now do uh, EF go ahead tours with adults. And I also use other tour companies to do adult only and multi generational trips. Um, all of my trips that are multi generational are teenage through senior citizens. So if you're looking for uh, a tour, if you're looking to get back into travel, feel free to um, contact me and I'd be happy to uh, either connect you with one of the groups that I'm doing or another group that suits your needs. In terms of virtual tours, there's a couple reasons why I got started. Um, one, about more than a year ago, actually, um, when COVID struck, I really wanted to support the tour director community during the time of travel restrictions where there has been no work for all the tour guides and the tour directors. I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my travel group too. And um, by doing that, we extended the opportunity to those of you who've learned about us through friends and family on social media, especially Facebook and other means. We've done more than 40 tours in the last year since COVID has struck. And if you'd like to access any of the recordings from before you started following us, or if you've missed one here and there um, throughout the weeks, please go to my Facebook, I'm sorry, please go to my website, girltraveltours.com. You can also view the videos on my Facebook page and my YouTube channel. All of them go by girltraveltours.com. We have several more tours planned for the coming months. Um, through the summer, we have them already on the website and you can sign up for them. We have Sydney, Australia, Wales and Cornwall, India, Venice and Jerusalem. They will round out the middle of the summer months and I'm working on the August, September and October tours now and they should be on the website in the next several weeks. As long as you're interested in viewing these virtual tour presentations, we will continue to produce them, bringing you new and exciting destinations all the time. I know many of you found out about this virtual tour series on Facebook, so I do want to just give a little shout out warning to um, you all who are on Facebook right now. Please don't click through on any of the links in the um, comments that might be pointing you to this tour. You are on it if you're watching us, so there's no, there's no reason to click through. There are still scammers um, on our page and they try to get you to click through and give you a credit card to enter. So please know that you should just stay off of those links. Um, if you're looking for um, if you're if you're looking to get information about our future tours, um, both virtual and physical, you can go to my website at Girl Travel Tours. Okay, before we get going, I wanted to share with you a few ways that we can interact. The first thing we always do to start out each. Um, each virtual tour presentation is a poll and I want to launch that poll now. Essentially, it gives us an idea of what your connection is with the destination that we're going to visit today. And today we're going to ancient Rome. So tell us, have you been to uh, Rome and, and the ancient um, Forum and Colosseum? So the choices are I've been and loved it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the location or I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. So I'll tell you that I have had a trip booked for several years now that we have continued to push back um, in our COVID times. So we were supposed to travel in 2019, no 2020, then we were supposed to travel in 2021 and um, now we're pushed back one more year. So. We hope to get to ancient Rome very soon and see our tour director there. But um, for the rest of you, let's see where it sits. It looks like at least half of you have been to this location and loved it. I'm going to share the results so that you can see it too. And it looks like a lot of you have no set plans but are interested in the location. And I know that after this presentation, you will fall in love with this area and the information that 
you can um, you can learn while you're there and it will jump up on your list to um, you have set plans or you have a trip booked. So I'm going to stop sharing that now. If it's still showing up on your screen, you might have to click on the top left hand button just to get it off your screen so it's not in front of the presentation. Okay, so today's tour, like all of our tours, are set for 90 minutes plus a Q&A. So I hope you're ready with a snack or a drink in hand. Um, a tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. For those unfamiliar with group travel, a tour director is like a personal travel concierge who stays with your group from start to finish and shares a world of knowledge, manages all your travel plans, and make sure that your experience is full of education. It's stressless and easy to navigate. These tour directors are by far the most important people in a group tour. And I just wanna mention that um, I just said a couple things that each tour that we do encompasses. There's education, there's history, there's culture, there's a little bit of fun. So please know we try to simulate our virtual tour presentations with the same kind of balance. And of course, if we are not traveling, these tour directors have not been working. I know Elena, who's joining us today, is on her second summer of not working, but we are hoping that the fall brings us new um, found travel and, and at least personal travel picks up as well as group travel. So if you find yourself in Rome uh, in the next several months, please know that you have a tour guide waiting for you that can show you the ins and outs of the city. Today, we're lucky to have back my dear friend, as I said, Elena Salerno, who will bring to you this virtual tour presentation. She's super knowledgeable about her country and the EU in general, and is an art historian to boot. She's very excited to share her passion for ancient Rome with all of us today. And I can say as a side note, in the middle of June, it is so much nicer perhaps to have this virtual tour instead of an in-person tour where Rome often finds itself in the high 90s and humid and extremely hot. So I know I'm in my air conditioned house, so this is a much more pleasant um, tour than what I may have been taking with Elena this year, although I will miss seeing her face to face. So anyway, I'd like to introduce you to my friend Elena Salerno. Elena, if you're ready, you can come back in and unmute yourself and put yourself on video and I will let you share your screen. Hello everyone. Hi Mara, thank you so much. As usual, you set really high expectations. <laughs> I hope I won't let anyone down. Um, I love the place that I'm taking you to tonight. Uh, I do live in Rome, so the Colosseum and the Roman Forum are my second home, uh, usually on normal years. I spend every day of my life either there or at the Vatican. Uh, I'm very happy to go back with you, even though just virtually tonight. Uh, I hope you will bear with me tonight. Uh, I hope I will uh, have made it fun and interesting. There is going to be a little bit of history in this presentation, of course. So we're going to talk about ancient Rome. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen so that you can all, I hope, see the slides huh, that I have put together for tonight. So ancient Rome revealed, hopefully. Let's start. As usual, I put together a little outline so as to set your expectations uh, as to what we're gonna do together tonight. Uh, we are going to start uh, with uh, brushing up uh, a couple of dates of important dates uh, from uh, Rome's history. We're going to then take a walk through the Roman Forum archaeological area, enter, of course, the Colosseum together and visit it. And we're going to end up with a nice dinner suggestion for your next uh, trip to Rome. I like to give you geographical references when we tour together. I use latitude to do so, so that you can see where you are compared to the places that we travel through together. Rome is set on the 41st parallel north, the line that you see on the map right in the south of Italy. Uh, moving eastward from Rome on the same parallel, we would encounter Uzbekistan's capital Tashkent, and in China, the parallel runs right north of the city of Beijing. 
Whereas from Rome, had we been traveling westward, we would encounter still in Europe, in Portugal, on the coast to the city of Porto. I know you guys visited Portugal with my colleague Manuel not so long ago. And on the um, east coast of the US, we would find Long Island, finally in the Midwest, Des Moines. These are your geographical references. Now, this next image is the map of downtown Rome. This is just the downtown portion of the city. Rome is one of the biggest cities that we have in Italy. And I wanted to show you on the map the area that we're going to cover together today, the one that I highlighted right in the middle, and to also show it to you in reality in a picture. This uh, is uh, an aerial view of the downtown portion of Rome. The highlighted portion is uh, the archaeological park uh, that comprises of the Colosseum, the Roman Forum, and the Hill of the Palatine. All of these uh, were included very early on uh, in the list of uh, World Heritage Sites uh, uh, that UNESCO oversees. This was uh, decided in 1980, so very, very early on in the history of UNESCO. Uh, here we go with the history, a little timeline, again, to brush up on the main dates of Rome's long, long history. We start with the conventional date of uh, uh, when Rome was born. Historians all agree that Rome was founded in 753 BCE, so we are before the year zero, almost eight centuries before. World famous twin brothers Romulus and Remus were the founders of the city. Actually, only Romulus, who very early on in the process of the foundation of the city, killed his twin brother, crowned himself king, and was the sole ruler of the city. So Rome, at the beginning of its life, was a kingdom. Uh, we have the seven kings of Rome uh, that are famous. After this first time period, uh, uh, and exactly in 509 BCE, this is the next big date that we're going to look at, after some civil unrest because of how the kings are behaving themselves, uh, Rome gets turned into a republic run by the Senate. Uh, so it's now the senators uh, who run uh, um, the show. After this date, we travel several centuries uh, through history. We arrive at 45 BCE. We are still before Christ. This is when Julius Caesar crowns himself dictator at the head of his army. So with the whole army strong, he seizes the whole power because he sees that the Republic is very corrupt and he actually has good intentions. But very early on, him too gets killed, famously stabbed in the Senate House by his own adoptive son, Brutus. Civil war ensues, and after some years, uh, in 27 BCE, the victor is Augustus, who gets crowned emperor. So this is the moment when Rome actually becomes an empire, 27 years before the year zero. And Augustus is the first emperor. He's going to rule for a long time. He's going to be ruling for 42 years, him alone. And uh, he's going to start a dynasty because, of course, from this moment onwards, uh, when an emperor dies, it's his son who gets crowned emperor. There's no election, there's no decision to be made. It is a hereditary title from now on. Now, at this moment in history, everything, well, the Colosseum is not a thing yet. First of all, we're gonna see the Colosseum at the end, but almost all the monuments on Capitoline Hill at the other end of the valley from the Colosseum and of the Roman Forum are almost all already done and completed. So this is the area that we're going to look at first. This is how the area looks like today. Of course, we've lost a lot throughout the millennia, because we're talking about two millennia ago. Uh, but we're going to see what's left. The uh, Roman Forum still today is uh, uh, crossed by the sacred road, uh, called the sacred because it was the route that uh, religious processions would take. Starting at the beginning of the Forum, they would go all the way up to Capitoline Hill, where the main temple, the temple to Jupiter was. There, the procession would end uh, with a sacrifice to the main god uh, um, and a festivity where the citizens would take part into. Now the temple doesn't exist anymore, but we are going to start from Capitoline Hill, so at the westernmost end of the forum, to look at what's left today. So we're looking at that corner now. This building is the first one that I wanted to point your attention to. This building is called the Tabularium, uh, started around 78 BCE, even though of what we see today, only the lower portion is the one that comes from that time. The 
add-on on top of the arches. It is a Renaissance addition of a building that was designed by Michelangelo um, during the Renaissance when Michelangelo was living in Rome working for the popes. At some point they asked of him to rearrange and redesign the area of the Capitoline Hill, and this is one of the buildings that he tackled. Nowadays, the building, we are looking at the rear of the building, actually, the one that overlooks the forum, uh, uh, the archaeological ruins of the forum is the rear of the building. Nowadays, the building houses the city government, so Rome's mayor works out of this building. This tiny balcony that you see in the tower to the right, that's the mayor's office. So when she goes to work, this, uh, more or less, this is her view overlooking the valley of the Forum and the skyline of the Colosseum in the distance. Now, next to the Tabularium, another monument that is um, in quite good conditions to this day is this um, huge arch in the middle of the uh, area that we're looking at. It crosses that sacred way that we were looking at before. This is a triumphal arch. It is called the Arch of Septimius Severus. Uh, built in the third century. Now we are after Christ. So this already gives me the chance to, to let you know that uh, when you look at the forum on images or in a video, but also when you are there in person, the Roman forum is a cluster of many different types of monuments, many different types of buildings built throughout a very long period of time. So all that you look at, every single thing that you look at was built at a different time period. It is a very stratified archaeological area. It is very difficult to read it and to understand it, even again, when you visit in person. So you see how we bounced from before Christ to after Christ uh, with a skip, you know, we skipped a couple centuries uh, uh, when looking at this arch. Uh, the arch is not the only one that is left in Rome. Triumphal arches were a thing for ancient Romans. Uh, they were always supposed to be freestanding monuments. So this was not an opening, a gate uh, in any way through a system of walls. It was always supposed to be freestanding. And the term triumphal comes from the fact that these arches would be put up um, with the decision of the Senate so the government of the city would decide to build one of these arches, paying for it with public money to commemorate, to celebrate uh, an emperor in case uh, of a very important um, military victory. So when the emperor led the army into battle or throughout a military campaign, uh, before he came back victorious, if the victory had been important enough, if he had killed enough enemies, these were all the parameters that you, all the boxes that had to be checked in order to you know, be eligible for um, the building of a triumphal arch, then they would put up this arch and uh, the arch would be used passing through the central opening by the triumphal procession, a triumph for the ancient Romans was a military parade led by the emperor on his golden chariot coming back to Rome again, victorious from a military campaign, followed by all of the army, followed in turn by the prisoners in shackles to be shown off, to be paraded in front of the citizens of Rome to show them what mighty warriors had been defeated by, you know, the power of the Roman army and closing up the rear, the carts bearing the loot, the gold and the, and the silver and all the precious objects that the army was bringing back to Rome to add to the treasury of the state. Uh, so this is what Triumphal Arches were. We're going to see another one. There are three or four in Rome left and several throughout Europe and in Northern Africa, because of course they were built in more than one location. Now the corner of the Roman Forum that we've been looking at, this is a, a drawing of what it must have looked like originally. At the very back where you see the arches uh, and the statues, that would be the tabularium, the first building that we saw that for the ancient Romans uh, was uh, the National Archive. Whereas in the foreground to the right, you see the triumphal arch of Septimius Severus in between buildings and temples and columns, freestanding columns that we've lost. Now, next to the triumphal arch of Septimius Severus to the right, we see this other building. 
our next stop. This is a building that it's in pristine conditions considering its age. This is called the Curia, started in 29 BC. Of course, it was retouched many times throughout the ages, but 29 BCE is the original date of this building. Uh, originally, it must have looked like this. Archaeologists have studied it and have come up with possible renderings. It would have had this porch, this portico in front of it with columns and some decorations on the ceiling that we've lost. So nowadays the front looks like this, so where you see the holes underneath the windows, uh, that was where the, um, the portico was hooked to the facade. It is in such good conditions because very early on in time, right after the fall of the Roman Empire, so at the beginning of the Middle Ages, this place was turned into a church and it was used continuously for centuries. So of course it was well maintained because they needed it uh, to be standing. Uh, you know, they, they had to keep it standing. So that's why it's in such good conditions. Inside, it is beautiful to visit. The floor is still the original multicolored inlaid marble floor. It is not usually part of the classical tour of the Roman Forum, but it is used very frequently by the um, foundation running the archeological park to house conferences. Uh, usually they are for free, so you can just sign up and you can visit also the inside of what was originally the Senate House. And so senators would uh, um, assemble here every day and conduct, you know, all government related uh, issues uh, from this uh, from this building. Now we've shifted a little bit the focus uh, to the left. You can see the Arch of Septimius Severus and the Senate House to keep it as a point of reference. Uh, we're now gonna encounter a very peculiar building, this one in the center. This is uh, a church. Uh, you can see the cross on top of it. This is the Church of St. Lawrence, uh, started in the very early Middle Ages, seventh century after Christ. Uh, of course, the version of the building that we see today is the result of uh, uh, some uh, Baroque uh, uh, remodeling. But then you can also tell that there's something weird about this church. The, the, the columns in front of it don't really add up. In fact, the church was built within what remained of a Roman, an ancient Roman temple, the temple to Antoninus and Faustina built in the second century after Christ. So what happened? A couple of things that I wanted to tell you while looking at this building. Uh, from the time of Julius Caesar, the first man after the Republican times to seize all of the power into his hands, from his moment onwards, uh, every emperor upon his death would be turned into a god by the Roman population. They would start to venerate uh, the emperor as a god, as a divinity. And of course, they would put up temples uh, to worship him. So this temple was built originally for the wife of an emperor when she died in the year 141. Faustina was her name. And then 20 years later, when her husband, the emperor Antoninus died, a dedication to him was also added. So then the temple was dedicated to both of them being turned into divinities, into gods. Now, the second very strange thing about this building, if you look at it from a little up closer, you can see the green door in between the columns. Now that was the original entrance to the church, the main door to enter the church. Maybe you can tell that now it's impossible to use that door. What happens? Um, in Rome, the level of the ground changed very much through uh, throughout the centuries. It rised. And this is because of many different reasons. Uh, we have a river, the Tiber River, running through the city that, of course, brings with, uh, with its course debris that then deposits uh, onto its side. So this already makes the level of the, uh, of the ground rise. Uh, Sometimes uh, even the ancient Romans would not use the building anymore and destroy it and build on top of the ruins uh, of what they weren't using anymore. Sometimes we did this during the Middle Ages. So all of this contributed to the level of the ground rising. When the church was built uh, in the seventh century, the level of the pavement uh, of the ground in Rome was at the base uh, of the green door. 
But then, more recently, in more modern times, um, when archaeology became a thing, archaeologists excavated uh, all the ruins of the Roman Forum and they dug deeper than that level. They wanted to uncover, to bring to light the levels that were there before the seventh century. So going back all the way to the time of the first emperor Augustus, the pavement now that we walk onto when we uh, walk um, within the Roman Forum is the one that was paved uh, around the year zero. And it is at the base of these uh, brick steps that you see. Now, the columns of the church, uh, of the temple, sorry, that remain, have these uh, slits into them. I enlarged the image a bit. You can see these diagonal slits at the very top of the columns. They, it is said uh, that they were left, they were marks uh, made in the columns, carved in the columns, uh, to allocate ropes. Uh, when they wanted to build a church, they tried to tear down what was left of the temple. But of course, uh, given that the level of the ground had risen from the time when the temple was built, the columns were partly underground. Uh, so they resisted very well to this, uh, uh, to this, um, um, to this tryout of tearing it down. And so finally, they decided to build a church within the ruins of the temple to just use the frame, the beautiful frame of the columns. This is what the temple must have looked like originally with all its decorations, with all its columns intact and the, the foundation also covered up in marbles and bricks. Now we have left the Church of St. Lawrence. You can see it to the very left of the picture. We keep walking along the sacred way. We are making our way towards the Colosseum. We encounter another couple of monuments in the Roman Forum before we get there. The next one is this massive building or, or what remains of it. This was the Basilica of Constantine completed, not started by, but completed by Emperor Constantine at the beginning of the fourth century. Now, when I say basilica, I know we our minds go right away to churches because nowadays many Christian churches are named basilicas, but the term was actually borrowed by Christians uh, uh, from the time of the ancient Romans. For the ancient Romans, a basilica was um, a civilian building, not a religious one. It was just a huge covered hall that could accommodate a big crowd that they would use for many very purposes. Uh, they would hold trials in basilicas. They would conduct businesses. Uh, some politicians could give their speeches. Uh, people could just meet up. Uh, so given the Roman Forum was the center of the city, it was the main economical, financial, religious, political, and social center of town, there were many basilicas within the Roman Forum that, again, the people could use for many different uh, um, business and uh, reasons. The Basilica of Constantine was the biggest one ever built. So this is the plan of uh, uh, what the original building was like. And I just wanted to show you, it is very, it looks very much like a Christian church. And this is because when Christians were finally free to build uh, their churches, uh, they had to decide on what shape to give to their uh, buildings of worship. And they had many examples of religions that had come before them. Should we build them like pyramids? Should we build them like synagogues? Or should we you know, uh, take our inspiration from the ancient Greeks and Romans who built temples? But they chose uh, the basilica, the shape uh, of this type of big hall, because Christianity from the beginning was a very inclusive cult, uh, and they wanted to be able to accommodate a big crowd when saying mass. Uh, so the basilica had the perfect shape to accommodate this need. The only little change they did is for the Romans, the entrances to the basilica would be on the longer side of the building uh, in the image where we see number five so that this big crowd could enter quickly and exit quickly, whereas the Christians shifted the axis of the building, uh, making the altar coincide with the east, one of the two shorter sides, and the entrance right opposite on the western shorter side, uh, for symbolical reasons, not for crowd control.
Now, these are again, the remainings of the huge Basilica of Constantine. I wanted to show them to you with a couple of people in the image so that you can really tell uh, how huge these are. And we are left uh, with one third, only one slice uh, of the building. Uh, this would have, you have to triple it in your mind to get an idea of how huge the building would have been originally lavishly decorated in on every inch of its internal surfaces and so well built for the purpose that it had to serve that it was the inspiration they used when they built the original New York City Penn Station. So this, of course, they demolished the station in the 1960s, but for the original building, they looked at the Basilica of Constantine. So after 2000 years, we are still admiring the Romans for their engineering and architectural skills. Couple of images to show you, of course, these are renderings, but to show you what the Roman Forum must have looked like when it was uh, whole and when it was completed, uh, it must have been uh, something to walk these streets with all these monuments covered up in precious marbles and stones, uh, painted over, colored, decorated with statues uh, and different friezes. Uh, so it really must have been a monumental area uh, for ancient Romans, uh, but that they were used to. Huh? They, they used it, as I said before, as the social point uh, uh, of the city. Now, we started at the westernmost point uh, of uh, the Roman Forum with the building closing it up. We're going to end uh, at the opposite side. Uh, I hope you can see what I highlighted. It's a tiny monument in the map. It is this monumental arch. This is another one of those triumphal arches that we were talking about before, even though this is older than the one we saw. This is the Arch of Titus, built circa 90 years after the year zero, uh, very much decorated. Uh, if you look through its opening, you can actually see the end of the forum, the building that you see with the bell tower in the middle. That is the first building that we looked at. So this is all the way that we've come from. Um, it is, as I said, uh, very much decorated even outside, but what interests us most are the decorations within its pillar. So in the inner part of the opening on the both sides, we have these high reliefs. They are very important. They tell us a lot of things. The one to the right shows us the triumph that triumphal procession uh, of Emperor Titus, to whom the arch is dedicated. So he's on his chariot led by his horses, and this is the beginning you know, of that procession that we talked about. Uh, why was he celebrated? Titus had conducted a very long, actually, military campaign, a very hard one, but he was finally victorious in conquering, well, in um, reconquering, let's say, the portion of the empire that was called Judea, nowadays Israel and Palestine, that, area, that geographical area. They had been a province uh, um, under the Roman Empire, under Roman rule for quite some time, but they had rebelled to Roman occupation, and it was Titus uh, as the son of the emperor. He wasn't the emperor yet, who was sent uh, to lead the campaign to, um, to bring order again in Judea, and he did. He conquered the city of Jerusalem, one of the most defended, uh, well-defended cities of antiquity, so that, that's why it was very difficult for him to succeed. Finally, he did. He conquered the city and he came back to Rome with a lot of loot. All the objects uh, that he took uh, from the temple of Solomon uh, that he had destroyed uh, during the fightings in Jerusalem, the main temple for uh, Jews. We can see very well a menorah amongst the objects paraded in this triumphal procession. This is important from the point of view of art history. This is the very first depiction ever of a menorah, but it is also historically important for Rome 
because uh, the destruction of the Temple of Solomon left only one wall standing of this temple. This is the Western Wall today. So if you visit Jerusalem, you can visit what uh, Jewish people call the Western Wall, what us not Jewish people call the Wailing Wall. This is a wall that was uh, part of the perimeter of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, the only one standing after the conquest of Titus. Jewish people still go to this wall to mourn the destruction of their temple 70 years after Christ that happened 70 years after Christ. And the second important thing is that the loot brought from the treasury of the temple back to Rome helped paid for the Colosseum. Rome is very much built on the blood and suffering of other civilizations and other people that came either before or at the same time as the Romans. We need to also say, you know, what's uncomfortable. In this image, we see the Arch of Titus that we just looked at, that is nowadays the entrance to the Roman Forum when coming from the Colosseum, and right after it, the opening where the Colosseum stands. I wanted to show you uh, in some footage what we just saw. Mm. We start from the end. You see the Colosseum and the Arch of Titus in front of it. Uh, within the Roman Forum, we saw the Basilica of Constantine or what remains of this massive building. Uh, of course, here and there, when you walk uh, through the Roman Forum, you have uh, what remains of other temples, other buildings, storage facilities. Again, it was um, a, an era that was used um, with very many different purposes. The Church of St. Lawrence. And then we have the Curia, the Senate House, the Arch of Septimius Severus, the Tabularium, the other remainings uh, of uh, uh, ancient Roman times, uh, and the fantastic view. This was shot, I shot this from the top of Palatine Hill, so it overlooks into the Valley of the Forum, but you also have a fantastic view overlooking the skyline of Rome. Uh, we left uh, our timeline uh, in the year 27 uh, before Christ when Augustus uh, becomes the first emperor and starts uh, his own dynasty. We get all the way following the same dynasty to the year 54 after Christ this time, uh, so some time has passed. This is when a very young Nero becomes emperor. Nero is important for many different reasons. So first of all, he is the last one in the line of succession uh, of in the dynasty that Augustus had started. Um, during his reign, 10 years after he becomes emperor, there is a very big happening in Rome, a very big event in 64, the great fire that destroys most of the city. Nero is famous for, you know, having sung uh, um, Greek lyrics while the city was burning, uh, because apparently some historians had described him as a uh, mad, totally mad. Nowadays, we know that he didn't set fire to the city, but he has, uh, you know, this uh, uh, infamous uh, uh, memory linked to his name. Now, to show you what the Great Fire was and why it's important, I'm showing you what Rome looked like on the 18th of July in the year 64, divided into 14 different neighborhoods or administrative divisions, okay? This, the fire starts on the night of the 18th of July. Nine days later, it burns for nine days. They are not able to quench it. Nine days later, the city looks like this. Only four of the 14 regions uh, are left intact and not touched by the flames. 10, the remaining 10, are completely obliterated by the fire. So this is total destruction. 200,000 people, it has been estimated, lost their lives uh, in this fire. Um, many of them, of course, had lost their homes, uh, their belongings, their possessions, their families. Emperor Nero, at the beginning, starts helping the population. He opens up some private gardens so that the people, you know, can get away from the flames. But he also sees uh, this as an opportunity. So of all this land that has been cleared by the fire, he decides to take a little bit for himself to build his own residence. He builds this residence. You can't really call it a house, can you? It's pavilions, porticos, gardens, parks. It gets nicknamed the golden house for how much solid gold that was used to decorate it. It was lavishly decorated. Um, 
two things about the golden house. First of all, maybe, you know, the painting doesn't really give you the idea, but it was occupying three hills within the city of Rome. And this was land that before had been inhabited by people. So land that the, the emperor just took ownership of, but that wasn't his. And second, and most importantly, probably, he paid for all of this with public money. So he, you know, the, the empire went bankrupt uh, at, um, um, under Nero. He even had uh, an artificial lake uh, built uh, within uh, this uh, huge residence uh, where he had a boat at anchor. Uh, on the boat, he would have parties with his friends uh, all night long. Uh, we would call them booze cruises nowadays. Uh, the thing is, Nero, we judge him very harshly when we hear these stories. Uh, but there is one detail that I haven't told you. Nero becomes emperor when he's 14. He's a teenager. He just wants to have fun. He is the son of the previous emperor. So from his birth, he knew he would never have to work a day in his life. He was meant to be the emperor and he's just a spoiled brat. What can we say? Anyways, uh, the city, uh, when they see Nero building his residence, they start believing he is the one who set the fire, that he had this design in mind from the beginning. So he needs a scapegoat. And what better scapegoat that a sect uh, of religious people born kind of recently that everybody is still suspicious of. The Christians uh, get uh, uh, to be the object uh, of the hatred of the people. Nero uh, starts the rumor that it was them setting the fire and he starts uh, the first uh, persecution of Romans in the history of uh, the city of Rome. During this persecution, uh, both St. Peter and St. Paul will lose their life uh, and many more martyrs, of course, uh, would be created during this persecution. At this point, everybody hates Nero. Everybody's also plotting against him, the Senate, the army, the Praetorian guards, so his personal bodyguards. So at some point, uh, he is driven to suicide. But he dies without an heir. He's the last one, remember, of the dynasty started by Augustus. So after a very short civil war in 69, it is a general of the army, Vespasian, very much respected by the Senate, who gets chosen as the next emperor. And he starts a new dynasty, the Flavian dynasty. Now, Vespasian is very much respected by the Senate and loved by the army, but the people really don't know him. He's never spent much time in Rome. He's always been abroad in, on his military campaigns. And he's a very smart man. He knows he needs a very big PR move uh, in order to let the people know that he's on their side. And what he decides to do is, uh, because everybody hated Nero, he decides to destroy the golden house that Nero had, had built with public money, bankrupting the empire in the process and to give the land back to the people. And on top of that artificial lake, he drains it and he sets the foundation for what will be the biggest spectacle venue in all of Rome's history, the Colosseum. He starts it, but he's already kind of old when he gets uh, um, nominated emperor, so he doesn't see it finished in the year 80. It is his son Titus, the same one that we talked about uh, regarding Jerusalem and the arch that we saw before, who finally inaugurates it and gives us the Colosseum. So now that we are at the threshold, we grab our ticket, we step inside, and we start walking through the passageways of the Colosseum. The first thing that I like to point out when I enter is that the arch is the main architectural feature the Romans decided to use within the Colosseum. Uh, very simply put, maybe I hope you can tell in this photo that even the, the, the roof um, is a vaulted uh, roof, right? it's a vaulted ceiling uh, over the passageway. Very simply put, an archway is a very good way of ensuring stability because of everything above it, the weight of anything above an arch gets distributed very well to the two sides, more so than with a flat opening or flat ceiling. Now, Rome, this, this is, of course, a, a picture taken nowadays of two beautiful lakes um, uh, at, in the south of, of Rome, in the countryside south of Rome. But these two lakes occupy the craters of what once were volcanoes. The area in the time of ancient Rome was very much uh, uh, seismic. 
lots of volcanoes, lots of earthquakes. So the Romans knew that they had to build their monuments earthquake proof, and they had the capability of doing this when the Colosseum was, was built, when it was uh, uh, originally uh, completed, it was totally earthquake proof. Now the Romans knew, as we know nowadays, of course, that in order to withstand the force of an earthquake, a building needs to have some elasticity. It has to be able to follow the waves of the earthquake and then go back to its place. So the Romans knew this, and in order to give this elasticity to their building, the technique that they used was uh, to not glue together with mortar the blocks of stones. These blocks of stones were not put together with any plaster in between them. They were just placed one on top of the other or one next to the other. And then in the very center of the block, a hollow space was left some metal would be poured into this hollow space. In the case of the Colosseum, it would have been bronze. And by getting cold, uh, of course, the metal would stiffen up and form a sort of clamp that would hold together the blocks, giving stability to the building, but also allowing for that elasticity that was needed during earthquakes. So what happened? <laughs> we are definitely left with not all of the Colosseum. Parts of it definitely collapsed. Why, if the building was totally earthquake proof at, at the beginning of its history? It has to do with the holes uh, that you see everywhere around the Colosseum. The Romans nowadays, they nicknamed the Colosseum the temple with holes uh, because it really looks like a Swiss cheese. Uh, and every one of these holes corresponds to someone in later times, uh, so during the Middle Ages mostly, digging up the metal clamps to retrieve the bronze. Bronze during the Middle Ages had become a very rare material, very expensive to make, very much needed, especially to uh, melt it down and forge weapons for the very many wars that were, were fought in Europe in the Middle Ages. They knew about this technique that the Romans had employed in their monuments uh, and many other monuments, in fact, um, that we are left with from ancient Rome are full of holes because, again, of the people uh, going for digging for the metal. So in the Colosseum, there's no bronze left. None of the original metal clamps are left. Uh, and that's why parts of it uh, throughout the ages collapsed, because at some point uh, uh, it was left undefended uh, completely. Now we look at the plan for a second because I wanted to show you also what it looks like from above. Uh, the Colosseum's uh, idea came from the theater, the type of structure that the theater was. Uh, this was invented by the Greeks, used also by the Romans. In these types of venues, uh, they would hold the same exact shows that we hold today in theater, so plays, comedies, dramas. But for other types of spectacles, the Romans invented a new type of venue. They doubled up the ancient Greek theater. They called it amphitheater. Two Greek words put together. Theater in Greek means to see. Amphi on all sides, all around. So in a place like the Colosseum, in an amphitheater, wherever you were seated, you would have a good view of what was happening on the stage, amphitheater. Uh, the plan also shows us uh, how the Colosseum uh, had this huge stage in the very middle. Mm. So the stage is now an all-around stage, of course. Uh, this and only this part of the structure was what the Romans called arena. Nowadays, we use the term arena for to refer to the whole venue. For the Romans, it was only the stage floor. Arena in Latin means sand. They called the stage floor sand because they would scatter sand all over the stage floor more than once throughout the day during a, a day of spectacles to soak up the blood, to soak lots of gory details in the Colosseum, to soak up the blood of the animals that would be wounded or killed on the stage, to soak up the blood of whoever would have been executed, criminals were executed, to soak up the blood of the gladiators that were wounded very frequently and sometimes also lost their life. Now, the Colosseum is also, as we see from the plan, a perfect uh, system of passageway, concentric ones and straight ones, cutting this concentric ones through. Because this place, uh, when it was whole, it could house up to 80,000 people. 80,000 people that you had to let in in the morning and all let out at night. And I always ask the visitors that I'm with, uh, 
if you go to a football game nowadays in a stadium with another 80,000 people, how long does it take at the end of the game to empty out the stadium? Well, this is Wembley Stadium. These are 80,000 people exiting after a game. It takes a long time, a long time. The answers I get vary from half an hour to an hour and a half, all the way to an hour and a half. Well, they've calculated this and they uh, realized the ancient Romans were able to fill up the Colosseum at the beginning of a day, but also empty out completely at the end of the spectacles in as short as 15 minutes. So they were really good. They knew what they were doing when they were building stuff, the Romans did. Now, on the ground floor, every single one of these arches was an entrance slash exit, of course. There were four main ones at the end of the two main axes, north, south, west, east. The western and eastern one were called the gate of life, the one through which every everyone who would perform, every gladiator, every acrobat, everyone who would perform during the day would enter, salute the spectators already seated, and then go to wait for their turn. The gate of death opposite to the east of the Colosseum was the one that would be used whenever a gladiator would be either wounded so badly that he couldn't walk or killed so his uh, body would be taken out of uh, the eastern gate of the Colosseum. It made geographical sense right outside of the Colosseum. We can still see today the ruins of what was the main gladiatorial school in ancient Rome called the Ludus Magnus. This is what it, it would have looked like originally. This was really the residential quarter of the gladiators where they would have their dorms so they would sleep here, they would train here, they would eat here. There was even a mini arena, a mini Colosseum you see built in the middle of the residential area so that they could train in a place that had the same proportions as the Colosseum. And even nowadays, we can see half uh, of the perimeter of that uh, mini arena that was built for their trainings. The north and south gates uh, were the VIP ones. Uh, so senators, uh, important guests, uh, the emperor and his family, of course, who had his own VIP box uh, where he would uh, seat himself to watch the spectacles. That would have been where I marked the spot on the southern side. Everybody else uh, had to have these tokens with them. The games were offered for free. It was a way of keeping the population happy with the rulers, but uh, in the days leading up to the spectacles, these tokens with numbers on them would be distributed to the population, and once you got your token in your hand and in front of the Colosseum, you wanted to look for the arch that had the same numeral as the one on your token. That would have been the entrance that you needed to go through in order to get your seat as quickly as possible. So so even you know getting in was uh, very much well thought of now from the stage area once you were inside of course you couldn't just seat wherever you wanted it was a question of your social status uh, from the stage the very first level would have been uh, um, reserved for senators behind them the knights so the most important part of the army the ones fighting on horseback behind them nobles behind them plebeians what we would say commoners or, or um, peasants, and behind everybody else, at the very top, the nosebleed seats, we call them nowadays, uh, three category of people, slaves, kids, and women. Women of all social classes, by the way, they were very much uh, uh, misogynists in Roman society. Uh, there was a law that stated that women, even noble women, could not sit together with their husbands uh, in the theater or the amphitheater. They had to be separated. The law was written because uh, the rulers of ancient Rome wanted to avoid flirting and people that were married uh, to flirt with uh, others uh, during these um, social gatherings. This is a model, a reconstructed model, to show you what the, the seating arrangement would have looked like with all the steps covered up in marble slabs uh, where people would take uh, their seat. Again, the plan shows us how much we've lost. Uh, this would have been the plan of the whole Colosseum. This would have been what the Colosseum would have looked like from the outside. Where are all the statues gone, lost forever? Uh, we've lost... Uh, um, half of the two outer shells of the Colosseum. The two outer walls have come down, uh, remember, with earthquakes. This is also why we have this very diagonally sharp edge 
Um, this was, of course, reconstructed. Uh, this was a restoration that was done in the 1800s uh, in order to avoid the further collapsing of the outer wall. Thankfully, that we don't do this anymore. We don't reconstruct, we don't add uh, to something uh, if uh, it's ruined. Thankfully, what they did was very smart. They used a different material. So when you see the bricks, you know that that's an addition of the restorers. Uh, and you can always tell where the restoration ends and where uh, the actual original part uh, is. Um, also, with the aid of an aerial view, you can see on the pavement outside of the southern side of the Colosseum, they set this white line of marble to mark the spot uh, where the outermost wall would have been had it still been standing. One last thing that we lost, uh, the velarium, this thing that you see on top of the Colosseum, this was a retractable awning that would have been maneuvered by a specially trained group of sailors from the Roman fleet from the outside with a system of ropes. It could be opened up onto the spectators to shade them in case of, you know, scorching Sundays, as Mara was mentioning before, they were very real even in ancient times. Now we are we are finally ready to uh, get up the steps. So we are going to use the same steps uh, as the ancient Romans. It always blows my mind. These are the original ones in very good conditions, uh, very much slanting. Mm -hmm. Everybody's always complaining when we have to hike up the steps of the Colosseum. They are very tall steps and they're very slanting. This was one of the devices used for crowd controlling. When you are descending the steps, it helps you kind of go faster. Um, or also maybe break your neck sometimes when you're going, when you're moving upwards, uh, then it slows you down uh, uh, as to avoid, you know, jams uh, within uh, the stairways of the Colosseum. Once we get on top, this is the passageway, the ring passageway that is not covered anymore because the, the ceiling of this passageway collapsed, but it would have looked like the one we saw underground, uh, sorry, um, on the ground floor. And if we look to the side, this is what we're looking at, the inner portion of the Colosseum or what's left of it. You see, we are left with none of the seatings, none of the steps covered in marble. Marble was also a precious material that was stripped completely from the Colosseum in later ages. The, there is only a little portion of the steps that is reconstructed. At the time, a um, crowded uh, day at the Colosseum would have looked like this, uh, with all the marble and the statues in their place. Uh, if we get to the shorter eastern side, uh, what we are looking at opposite us, uh, that opening uh, is the Gate of Life, uh, the one to the western side of the Colosseum, the one that all the performers would use uh, as an entrance gate in the morning. Uh, this is what it looks like when you pass through it. Uh, this is what the gladiators would have seen when walking into the Colosseum. From the same point of view, we also can see that there is a portion of the stage floor of the arena that has been reconstructed. This was uh, put up in 2000, but it was reconstructed following very closely the original design. So this is a wooden stage that at the time would have covered up completely the pit in the middle of uh, the structure, in the middle of the venue like this. So all the structures that we now see would have been covered up, uh, the ones that we see now uh, occupying uh, the pit underneath the arena. This is what the reconstructed stage looks like from uh, uh, beneath it. This was made modular by the Romans uh, with these uh, poles uh, that could be taken apart and put back together a little bit like Legos without having to break them. Because at the very beginning of the life of the Colosseum, uh, the pit was hollow. It was completely empty. These structures that we see nowadays, they were built several years later. At the beginning, it was empty. And when taking away the stage, they would fill up the pit with water, bring in ships and do mock naval battles in the Colosseum. If you remember, the Colosseum was built in the same spot where Nero had had his artificial lake placed. So there was a perfectly working piping system underlying the Colosseum, there still is. So it could be flooded easily and quickly. And Romans were very fond of uh, 
reenacting famous naval battles or uh, mock naval battles in general. They did it in lakes, they did it in rivers, and they sometimes did it in venues such as the Colosseum. Um, then, uh, eight or nine years after the Colosseum was inaugurated, they built these underground structures. Why? Because if you remember, we saw that the amphitheater was taken as an idea from the theater, but the theater has a straight side where you have the stage and the backstage. The backstage here is not possible but because the stage is now an all around one. So you need to go underground for all the purposes of backstage uh, rooms. So this is two underground, two whole underground floors of passageways, corridors, and rooms where the Romans, you can visit them, by the way. There is a specific guided tour that takes you through the underground portion of the Colosseum. This is what it would have looked like uh, when it was whole. And as I was saying, two whole underground floors um, of rooms uh, where the Romans would keep everything that would have been needed at some point during the day on the stage. Uh, the animal pens uh, where they would keep the beasts, the exotic animals waiting for the moment uh, when to jump on the stage, the gladiators waiting for their moment to fight, all the props. Mm -hmm. The Romans loved the theatrics. Uh, so the day at the Colosseum would always, always, always start with the animal acts. Uh, and other than the animals, they would also bring on stage uh, uh, plants and trees, uh, maybe uh, rocks uh, to recreate the original environment of these animals and make it more real for the audience to look at a hunt or uh, some animal fights or whatever, you know, the um, spectacle with the animal that day was. Uh, in fact, uh, dotting uh, the arena, the floor of the stage, uh, there were 28 of these trapdoors. This is the only one that was reconstructed recently together with the piece of the stage. Underneath each trapdoor, a lift. Mm -hmm. Of course, this was man manned yeah? No electricity yet at the time of the ancient Romans. But uh, with manpower, they could lift the cage uh, all the way up to the level of the arena Imagine a beast inside the cage that arriving at the level of the trapdoor jumps out into the arena with a wow effect also for the 80,000 spectators holding their breath, waiting for something to happen. These were people that would live and die all in the same place, their whole life, never see anything else. Uh, the Colosseum was a place where spectacles were held for the, the people, the commoners, the plebeians, the peasants, to keep them quiet, to keep them happy. It was the movies of the time. It was the television of the time, if you will. So giving them something um, that would uh, wow them, that would surprise them, that would make them dream maybe was important. That's why the beasts uh, that were employed in the Colosseum were bears, boars, lions, giraffes, uh, hippopotamus, elephants, uh, tigers, every, any type of exotic animal they could put their hands on would be brought to Rome for the spectacles in the Colosseum. Some species uh, went extinct because of how many animals they slaughtered uh, in the games in the Colosseum. Now, we started the morning with the animal acts. Midday was dedicated, lunchtime was dedicated to executions of criminals. Now, of course, the ancient Romans had a very different moral compass than we do nowadays. First of all, they were not Christians yet. So the value of life was very different in their culture than it is for us. We tend to judge them very harshly when we learn that this was entertainment for them. But first of all, we do have our extreme sports, uh, very violent sports, uh, but also for instance, executing criminals publicly and on days when in the Colosseums you had games, you had 80,000 people already gathered. So it was a good moment to do things that you, went, you wanted to go public with, was not something done for the amusement of the people. It was something done as a crime deterrent. If you mess with our laws, if you break our laws, this is what's gonna to happen to you. The way of executing criminals, were very gruesome. You could be slaughtered by beasts, burnt alive, uh, or crucified. Again, gory details in the costume. Finally, at the end of the day, what everybody had been waiting for the whole day, 
gladiatorial fights. Uh, uh, this image is a little bit of a misrepresentation. Gladiators would fight only two at a time on the stage together with the referee. They needed to fight loyally, courageously, abiding by the rules of an honorable fight. And that's something that they would look for, the population other than uh, the authorities uh, and the emperor. At the end of the fight, it would be the referee deciding who had won and who had lost. Very rarely a gladiator died in a fight. Uh, they were owned by someone, they were slaves, and they were a very expensive commodity. You had to house them, feed them, clothe them, train them, give them the weapons to be deemed ready to fight in a place as prestigious as the Colosseum. You had to train for five years at least. So imagine what uh, an investment it was for the owner. They didn't really want them to die often. Also, the gladiators were the quarterbacks of the time, the superstar, the rock stars of the time. People had their favorite gladiator. They bet on them. There was a big business around them. Nobody really wanted them to die frequently. So it wasn't to the death, uh, the fight usually. It was the referee deciding when one had lost, one had won, uh, and, that, and that was it. So... We complete our turn around the first ring of the Colosseum. We look back into the pit and uh, we give a last uh, look from a distance uh, to the side where we have it whole as it must have looked like uh, when it was completed so majestic in its white marble. Now, I promised I would end with a dinner suggestion. This is a very fancy place, a very lovely called Aroma. This is a little play on words. Aroma, of course, means the same in Italian as it does for you in English. And Roma is the Italian name of Rome. So they played on words to name this place. This is a Michelin starred restaurant that has this terrace uh, overlooking uh, the Colosseum. So to have dinner here, it is quite expensive, but I think it's also worth it uh, um, when you spend some time in Rome as a memory to bring back. Now, since many of you have reached out to me um, at, uh, you know, after the previous events that I did for Mara, I just wanted to leave here my email address. So, because I know that Mara works a lot for these uh, presentations and these events, and I can't thank her enough for all the free work that she puts in. I'm very, very appreciative. So if I'm, I can help her, you know, um, have uh, one email less, uh, then this is my tiny, tiny contribution. So I hope you all enjoyed. I hope I will see you soon in Rome with the travel restrictions lifting. And I thank you very much for your attention. Grazie. Mara, back to you. Prego, prego. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so very much, Elena, as usual, for your thorough, entertaining, as well as extremely informative take on one of the places in your city, Rome. So I, I have been lucky enough to visit Rome with Elena. So if you find your way to Rome, um, please do look her up. She is a wonderful guide, not only in Rome, but anywhere particularly. Um, so I wanted to thank everybody for, for joining us today. And I just wanna take a moment to thank um, those of you who are able to tip. The guides truly do appreciate it. I mean, when we started, Elena was my first guide on a virtual tour back in May of 2020. And when we started this, we had no idea that we would be going into it more than a year without any type of physical travel in between. So I do wanna thank everybody personally and, I, and on behalf of the guides, I know Elena thanks you, but every guide that we've worked with is so very appreciative for, for all of your tips and even, even the wonderful things and the comments that you say, you know, it is so uplifting. And I know that not only the tips have kept the guides going, but just the ability to actually share their passion with their their countries and travel in general has been an amazingly emotional uplifting time for everybody so thank you for that um, I will point all of you to the slide that's up now if you are able to tip there are ways to tip I have texted in the chat and also put it in the Q&A 
Um, and I will send a follow-up email tomorrow, which gives you instructions on tipping. Um, you can always go to my website. There's a little uh, button at the top right that um, allows you to tip online um, on, a, on a secure site as well. So do what you can. And if you can't, we completely understand. Keep coming back and watching the tours. Um, at this point, we're gonna go over to the Q&A. And there are a lot of questions um, here for Elena. So I'm gonna let you kind of weed through them, Elena, and I will help you facilitate some, some uh, changes over as we go. So you go, go for it and I'll support you. Sure, ready. Um, first of all, Francis Rene, will you be showing or talking about Mamertine prison, the history of this location and the Apostle Paul? Just curious. So Francis, I didn't, show the Mamertine uh, prison. This is, Francis is referring to a, an ancient Roman prison uh, that can be visited today. It is within the ruins of the Roman Forum. It was the prison where allegedly St. Peter and St. Paul were incarcerated, uh, awaiting their execution during that first persecution uh, started by Emperor Nero. So I'm sorry, I Definitely, this was not a comprehensive overlook uh, in the Roman Forum. There are so many places that I couldn't cover because of time limits. Uh, it was just, you know, a little sample to show you what it could be if you come here. <laughs> so, Francis, I'm sorry I couldn't cover it more thoroughly. Andrea Popescu, where did the legend of the Capitoline She-Wolf originate? Andrea, where very difficult to tell, when also very difficult to tell, but we do have several sources, ancient writers and historians talking about it. And the legend goes that, you know, the twin brothers Romulus and Remus were left in a basket in the current of the river because their um, uh, evil uncle wanted to seize the power and didn't want them when growing up to, um, uh, to seize it from him, uh, so he was hopeful they would die, but they were found by She-Wolf on, on Palatine, sorry, Hill, and uh, um, she suckled them, she nurtured them, and they could grow up, and finally they became the founders of the city of Rome. The She-Wolf is now called Capitoline, not Palatine, so another one of the hills of Rome, because on top of Capitoline Hill, there are the Capitoline Museum, there is the Capitoline Museum uh, that is one of the biggest probably collections of uh, ancient artifacts that we have from those times. And the sculpture of the she-wolf suckling the two twins is, uh, in the, is the symbol of the museum. So that's why she's called Capitoline She-Wolf. An anonymous spectator, is CE Christian era or common era as used by the students now? I am of this new school of thought. Uh, it is just out of respect. I use CE as common era and BCE before common era because, you know, not all of the audience is going to be Christian or Catholic, so I want to be thoughtful. Jean Mansour. How were these buildings actually constructed? Oh, Jean, that could be a whole other presentation. Uh, the Romans were borrowing uh, lots of, or stealing actually, lots of building techniques uh, from other civilizations such as the Etruscans that had come before them in the Italian peninsula, occupying the Italian peninsula. Uh, they came up also with their own techniques. Uh, they um, employed uh, um, the use of concrete. Uh, they had cranes uh, uh, to you know, lift up the heavy blocks of stones. So uh, they had very complex, advanced, I would say, uh, building techniques, uh, even though, of course, they lacked a lot of the technology that uh, we have today, which makes, I think, what they accomplished even more you know, awe-inspiring. Jared Harrington. What is the rounded building after St. Lawrence building? So that is the temple of Romulus, not the Romulus of the, you know, not the founder of the city, another Romulus coming way after the first one. And it is a lovely round temple. It is not always open. Uh, the Colosseum uh, and the um, Roman Forum sometimes uh, house uh, some uh, um, exhibit, some temporary exhibitions, uh, and that's when the Round Temple of Romulus would be would be used uh, is used uh, to show part of the exhibition. Rhonda Hamilton, how far is it from one end of the road to the Colosseum? Well, if we started where we started ideally tonight at the Tabularium and we end and you end at the Colosseum, if you walk it without stopping.
walking, I would say 15 to 20 minutes. It's not that much of a distance, but in terms of centuries, uh, <laughs> Lisa Garwood, uh, the Western Wall, it was actually, is, it, it's what actually, was actually a retaining wall, sorry, not an actual wall of Solomon's temple. The temple was on the top of the mount where there now stands a mosque. Thank you, Lisa, for correcting me. Karen Siegel, not a question, but just FYI, Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BCE. The Romans destroyed the second temple in 70 CE. Karen, of course, you are correct. It is the second temple that was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE. Cheryl Green, Nero persecuted Christians or Catholics? Well, at the time there was no distinction. They were Christians, uh -huh. all of them Christians. An anonymous spectator, what part of the Colosseum is original? You can usually tell uh, what you see out of, made out of stone. It is not specifically a marble. It is a limestone that is quarried locally, but what you see made out of that whitish grayish stone, that's original. And parts of uh, the uh, things done in bricks are also original. If you remember the image that I showed you with the outer wall where it has the diagonal you know, ending that was reconstructed, those bricks uh, are looking very new. So you can always tell when the bricks are new and when they are actually uh, part of the original Colosseum. Karen Luffridge, the Christians were not fed to lions in the Colosseum, were they? No, Karen, they weren't. But for a long time, the Christians uh, believed uh, that the Colosseum had been used as a place of persecution, uh, but it, it never happened. Uh, it never happened. But this was actually lucky because uh, at some point in history, the Colosseum was used uh, for so many different purposes after the fall of the Roman Empire. They ceased using it for games because once Christianity took over, you know, the morality, um, they couldn't allow uh, such uh, uh, blood uh, thirsty games, you know, to to go on. So the Colosseum was shut down and it was used for many other different, it was used as a quarry for materials. Uh, we, we talked about the bronze clamps, but also the statues, the marble slabs. Uh, it was used um, for people to live in. People set up their homes. Uh, they set up animal pens within the Colosseum's walls. Uh, at some point, there was a glue factory in the Middle Ages set right in the middle of the Colosseum. It was the church, the Pope, specifically, who at some point, uh, because they believed uh, that Christian had uh, uh, lost their life um, in the Colosseum that decided, wait, we have to deem this uh, sacred ground uh, and start respecting it as a sacred ground. So that's what actually stopped, you know, the, um, the use of the Colosseum for other purposes. This was a very long answer, sorry. <laughs> Amelia Halim, do people back then need to pay tickets to watch the game and gladi gladiators in the Colosseum? No, the spectacles were always offered for free to the population. They had those tokens uh, that I showed you with the number on them um, that told them what entrance to use, but just for logistic purposes, uh, the games were, were offered. Um, Kit Hartford, did they have food and wine in the Colosseum during the events? Yes, they did. Uh, uh, going to the Colosseum, it wasn't something that happened uh, like every other day or every weekend. It was something that happened a little less frequently throughout the year. When it did happen, uh, very often they had more than one day uh, of games uh, and going to the Colosseum was a whole day affair for the Romans. So they started in the morning and they spent the whole day there. So they had what they called latrines. So they had restrooms with the running water. Remember the piping system that was functioning underneath the Colosseum served also this purpose. Uh, they had, uh, they, they brought food or they had, uh, you know, vendors of food and wine so they could spend the whole day. Janine Feit Herkert. I hope I have pronounced that right. Excellent tour. Thank you, Janine. I am still watching, but have a question. Is the construction for the subway completed in Rome near the Colosseum? Janine, it's not, it is not. Janine is referring to the stop that will be the station of the subway that will be opened right at the foot of the, if you can believe it, the Colosseum and the ruins of the Roman Forum of the third subway line in Rome. We already have two. 
the works have been going on since what, 15 years ago, and still we don't have it. So it sounds like a joke, but it's true. Another anonymous spectator, why does your illustration of the Colosseum show women? Was this just artistic license? Uh, I would need to go back to what I showed you. Um, oh, you mean uh, amongst the spectators, definitely just artistic license. It is true that Augustus emanated a lot. So at the very beginning of uh, the history of, of the time when Rome was an empire, Augustus emanated a law where he said, no, no, no women amongst men, uh, you flirt too much. Uh, I want, you know, he was a traditional, traditional family guy, we would say today. So he wanted to defend those values. Um, Doreen Bartholomew, once they flooded the pit, how did they get the water out? Um, well, to flood it, they had channels, of course, uh, that would bring the water in, but they could also channel the water out. Uh, so they had it going both ways. And then another anonymous spectators also is the fact that women were very limited in their ability to attend for reasons why to attend, sorry, the reason why there are so few ladies restrooms today, it seemed uh, there weren't very many when we were there years ago. <laughs> I've never heard this possible explanation. You're right, uh, there are not many restrooms, um, specifically in the Colosseum, the one. Um, I don't know if it's linked to that, I don't know. European history in general, from the time of the Romans and all throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So when the church uh, was um, ruling, you know, has um, its um, side of, um, you know, it has always been a patriarchy. So women were not well thought of. In Bates, uh, how many spectators could be seated in the Colosseum at one time? Uh, between 50,000 and 80,000, you know, estimates vary, but at 80,000 seems the maximum capacity of the Colosseum. Lawrence Jacobs, um, really great presentation. Thank you, Lawrence. By the way, which species became extinct from the Colosseum performances? Well, for instance, the European lion. That's a very famous one. In Europe, we had a, a type of lion, a type of big feline that was completely erased from the face of the, face of the earth by the Romans. Paula Woolrich. Elena, thank you so much. Thank you, Paula. It was my pleasure. Can I ask this question? Do these ancient structures suffer any damage from auto or air pollution? Absolutely. Definitely, yes. They suffer a lot from noise pollution, air pollution, traffic, uh, vibrations. So you see sometimes um, uh, a, a, an important a, a person of the, you know, the showbiz will ask, um, no, no, uh, you know, not to name names, but um, uh, Beyonce did it. She asked uh, to shoot uh, a video, um, a video clip for her song inside the Colosseum. They said no, because holding concerts and events in the Colosseum were a lot a big crowd enters all at once and the vibrations of the music uh, of the audio system, it ruins these structures structures a lot yeah Jessica Alcantara meraviglioso scusi mi italiano your Italian is perfect Jessica I'm wanting since 20 years ago to visit I wanted since 20 years ago to visit Rome surely I will meet you when we get to visit Rome saludos desde Querétaro Mexico thank you so much Jessica I hope to meet you in Rome one day Danielle Edwards, uh, when is the best time to come to Rome? Would February to May be a good time to visit? Danielle, February to May would be a fantastic time to visit in normal times. Uh, so let's forget about COVID for a second. If we all can do that, February would be the lowest month for tourism, which means no crowds at all. Everything is just there for you. Of course, the weather is, is not as lovely as in April or May, uh, but those are the best months to come, definitely. Robert Namath, uh, will everything be open next year? <laughs> Robert, look at me. I'm crossing my fingers. I d definitely hope so. We're good with our vaccinations. I got my vaccination, so it means we're doing good. Uh, we're also vaccinating the youngest. Uh, and uh, so I, I hope uh, we won't see another wave this next fall and we'll, we'll do good in the winter, you know, in the next year. And um, all is going to be good. Rebecca Branch, missed the first 40 minutes. Will this presentation repeat? 
Uh, we won't repeat it, Rebecca, but it, it's been recorded and Mara will put it up, uh, I think tomorrow, either on uh, uh, Girl Travel Tours Facebook page or on Girl Travel Tours website or also on their YouTube channel. So you have three ways of watching at your leisure. Marie-Claude Roussel, what is the best area to live in if we want to walk to see the attractions? Do you have any suggestions for hotels at a reasonable cost? Marie-Claude, um, the thing is that I'm very out of touch with the touristic scene in Rome. So many hotels have shut down because of the pandemic. And since I haven't been working uh, since 20, the beginning of 2020, I really don't know what's left. Uh, but if you do a very quick search on either Airbnb or online for hotels, you'll find plenty places. The best areas, uh, Rome is very spread out, okay? So for instance, the Colosseum is very far away from the Vatican. So there isn't one true center that uh, would serve, uh, you know, for all areas. What you want is to be close to a subway stop because the subway doesn't uh, uh, serve the whole of the city. But if you are on a subway spot, then you don't need a cab. You can just hop on the subway and uh, um, that's quite an efficient service. So th that would bring you, you know, to all the main uh, areas that you would want to visit in Rome. Anna Bastianelli. Is it true that part of the Colosseum marble was used in St. Peter Basilica? Yes, absolutely. Uh, when you walk uh, in the Vatican, uh, both in St. Peter's Basilica and in the palaces of the Vatican museums, you are walking onto marble inlaid marble floors. Uh, all those marbles come from ancient Roman monuments. Uh, the Colosseum included, the monuments in the Roman Forum included, so yes. Frédéric Dumont. Thank you so much, Elena, for my first online tour. It was my pleasure, Frédéric. Big success. It is plain and obvious you love sharing your knowledge. Question, where are the cemeteries of everyone? Burnt? Question mark. So uh, in Rome, there was a very strict law regarding burials. Uh, people could not be buried within the city limits for hygiene reasons. So all the cemeteries, the necropolis, are outside, outside of what were the borders at the time. Of course, Rome has, uh, has grown in the meanwhile, but um, along the main consular roads, uh, these were the main arteries uh, uh, leading from Rome to every other corner of the empire, you find uh, you know, the sarcophagi and the tombs and the, and the cemeteries. Ruel Robinson, you spoke about the punishment or execution of those who committed crimes as a deterrent for any potential future crimes for those observing. Did it actually work to deter? Ruel, maybe for someone, yes, but there was definitely, you know, crime in ancient Rome. I think it was exactly as it is today. Does the death penalty serve its, this purpose uh, in the countries in the world where they still use it? I don't know the statistics. Huh? I'm just uh, you know, giving you my um, logic uh, uh, answer, what I think is the logic answer. So it probably works a bit, um, not 100%. Rebecca Wrench, do you live in Roma? Are you married, single, children? Where did you study? <laughs> so yes, I live in Rome. I am not from Rome. I'm from the north of Italy, from a city called Milan, which is another great place to visit, even though we're way less known than Rome. I, but I now live in Rome. Rome, as for tourists, uh, cannot be beaten in uh, Italy. So there's a lot more work. I'm not married. I am single. I don't have children. I don't want children. I'm good with my two cats. I'm a cat lady. <laughs> Jessica Alcantara, how much is the entrance and the best season to visit? So the best season to visit is not the summer, anything but the summer. Uh, for two reasons, the, the heat that Mara was mentioning at the beginning, that's, that's, that's a real thing, especially in the Roman Forum where there's no shade whatsoever and you are, you know, under the scorching sun in June, July and August, you don't want to do that because you don't enjoy your visit really. Uh, and then for the crowds, uh, so in normal years, uh, um, crowds are huge in Rome in the summer. So you want to come between mid end of September to mid end of May, mm -hmm. the fall, the winter, the spring.
Silvia Russo. I've been to Rome three times in the 1980s, but always on our own and had no idea of the histories behind the monuments you showed today. If I can come back, I will definitely want you as my guides. Love all your tours. Thank you, Silvia. Another anonymous spectator. Can you please tell me how the arena was filled with water when there were underground lifts, corridors, and rooms? Thank you. So uh, the mock naval battles uh, and the possibility of filling the pit in with water, making it a water basin, was done before those underground structures were built. So the Colosseum was inaugurated in the year 80 for 10 years, more or less. The pit was left open with no constructions, so it could be filled and used with the with the boats. And after 10 years, uh, the next emperor decided, uh, under the next emperor, it was decided that they needed these underground structures uh, for backstage purposes. So that's when they had to stop and move the mock naval battles to other bodies of water. Um, Frederic Dumont again, how do we know women didn't mix with men in the Colosseum? There was a law, a written law, not just in the Colosseum, but um, every time there were spectacles of this, uh, of this uh, sort uh, and also at the theater. Of course, the Colosseum was the most prestigious and biggest of the amphitheaters that the Romans built, but it was not the only one. Uh, and it wasn't the, more the most ancient one, the most old one. The oldest, uh, uh, for instance, in Pompeii, I'm sure you've all heard of the city of Pompeii, the amphitheater, the city had its own amphitheater, and that's an older one than the Colosseum. It had already been built when Rome had its own Colosseum built. So everywhere there were there was a public, an audience, uh, women and men could not mix, uh, and we know because there was a written law about this. Susan D. Johnson, where was Circus Maximus located? So if you're, if I'm the map, um, here's the Colosseum. Uh, um, if I'm the map, here's the Colosseum, here's the Roman Forum, here is Palatine Hill, right underneath it in the map, after the Palatine Hill, going further underneath it is the Circus Maximus, biggest stadium ever built by the Romans. By the way, that's what Susan's referring to. Circus Maximus was a circuit for chariot racings, the biggest sport for ancient Romans. And it was the, the biggest venue they've ever built. It could hold up to 250,000 people, huh? the Circus Maximus. Now it's just a green field. Virginia Richards Taylor, what was the hexagonal building next to the basilica? Maybe you're referring to the round uh, temple of Romulus that um, I talked before. Karen, Jill, how far from the forum are the catacombs? Can people tour them today? Yes, so you can tour the catacombs. There are several in Rome and they are placed in different spots throughout the city. Um, they are not super close to the forum because uh, catacombs were tunnels that the first Christians built uh, in order not to be seen by the Roman authorities at a time when Christianity was illegal still. So they kind of went out of the city limits, you know, at the borders of the city uh, to build their catacombs. Uh, so as for the Roman cemeteries that we were mentioning before, the catacombs, usually you find them along those main arteries leading out of the city. But yes, you can definitely visit them. Linda Berger. Oh, one disclaimer. Sorry, guys, about the catacombs, because I get this a lot. They are not as the famous catacombs in Paris. The catacombs in Rome, they don't have bones. You don't see bones in them. The bones have been taken away. So the, the bones catacombs are the Paris ones. The Rome ones are stunning to visit. It's this whole underground city, you know, built uh, through tunnels with churches uh, underground and, and, and of course uh, necropolises, but you don't see bones, just a little disclaimer. Linda Berger, is there periodic conservation on the exterior of the Colosseum stonework to protect from the suit of the cars? There is periodic, yes, very far apart from each other, the uh, interventions. The last one was done well, about 10 years ago. They cleaned uh, the outer wall of the Colosseum, the outer arches. It's very, very expensive to do these restorations. So they usually have to rely on private investors. Uh, an anonymous spectator, um, who currently owns the Colosseum, <laughs> the Italian state? 
it is a public monument. Karen Smith, could you describe how the retractable roof worked? Yes. So the velarium, vela in Latin means a sail, like the sail of a boat, because it was done with the same material as the sails of the Roman fleet. Uh, so it was a fabric uh, um, made awning. Uh, and it was, um, so at the very top of the Colosseum, if you, if you were there, uh, had we been there when the Colosseum was just built, we would have seen uh, vertical wooden poles uh, sticking out of the top of the Colosseum. Now those poles were there to hold the ropes uh, uh, stretched uh, towards the center of uh, the uh, perimeter of the Colosseum. Over these ropes, uh, they would thread uh, the fabric of the awning of the velarium and then these ropes that were held by these vertical wooden poles would stretch outwards outside of the Colosseum all the way down to the pavement where there were uh, rings uh, set in the pavement uh, so that you could uh, thread uh, the ropes into the uh, ring and the sailors that were trained specifically to do this could maneuver with the ropes, uh, the awning, so they could uh, retract it, they could close it uh, if not needed, or opening open it up uh, to, onto the audience to shade them. They were so advanced uh, as to be able to actually move the awning so that they could fan uh, the spectators underneath it. It was sort of um, an AC of the time, if you will. Lori Kaufman, did any women fight? Yes. There has been some uh, uh, women gladiators in uh, in history, very, very rarely though. Huh? It wasn't uh, something very frequent. Robert Blanton, what is your favorite city in Italia? <laughs> Robert, it depends what you mean. If you mean to live in, then definitely my hometown Milan in the north. It's a very European city. So it's beautiful as an Italian city. It's very European in the sense that it's very efficient and everything works. Um, to visit, I love Sicily, the island to the south, uh, my favorite region. And um, what else? I love Puglia also, the hill of the Italian peninsula and the hill of the boot is a beautiful region to visit also. I'm very much attracted to the coast. I mean, you can tell. There's also all the Alpine region that is fantastic and the, the middle portion, but I like the seaside. Don Levine, did they pay the fighters? Yes, they paid the fighters. So a gladiator was a slave. He wasn't a free man. He was owned by his own, uh, um, by his owner, by someone who, you know, was his manager, let's say. Uh, when a gladiator won a fight, uh, there would be winnings involved. Uh, a very small portion of these winnings uh, would be given to the, the winning gladiator. So the majority of the sum would be kept by his manager and his owner, but some of it. So if a gladiator managed uh, to stay alive and stay healthy enough to fight for enough years and enough fights were won, he could buy his own freedom and become a free man. So this happened too. Stacy Hazur, how many times have you personally visited the Colosseum? <laughs> Stacy, I don't know. I have lost count. Um, I don't know. I've been working in tourism for almost 10 years now. So what, hundreds of times, hundreds of times. But let me tell you, it gets old. Huh? It's not, you know, it's gorgeous and I, I can still get excited about it, but it's the people that I go with that are different every time and their reaction to seeing these places and the history behind these places that makes it worth it. It's not, you know, the allure of the place itself, it fades away. Bernadette Israel. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Thank you, Bernadette. Do you see a time to come when the touring public will not be allowed access in order to preserve the structure? Very radical thinking, Bernadette. I don't see it. I don't think the Italian mentality goes in that direction. Uh, I. I think I'm, I'm, I'm quite open-minded and uh, critical, you know, towards mass tourism that exploits uh, the places uh, where people visit without really enriching them in any way. And it's just, you know, 
we call it the bite tourism where you you just go spend one night maybe or you're on a cruise so you spend the day and then you you leave you this doesn't enrich the place it just depletes it of uh, um of uh, resources uh i wouldn't agree in closing off the monuments to the public i mean this is our history it's our heritage it's important that we are able to enjoy it uh, um but in italy we are not you know criticizing masterism enough we're not doing enough to change uh, the ways uh, of tourism Ronald Thompson, wonderful presentation, Elena. Thank you, Ronald. What other recorded road travel tours, virtual tours were guided by you? I think Mara is typing a reply to this. So, but you can find them all on the Girl Travel Tours website or their Facebook page or their um, YouTube channel. I did a first walking tour through Rome, actually, eh, Mara. That was our first one in May last year. And then Paris, Greece. Uh, the Vatican, Florence, um, Amalfi, the Amalfi Coast and Pompeii, we did a few. Bill Griffith, our family will be in Rome next June. What is the best place to book tours? Is it too early to secure tours? So Bill, if you wanna do guided tours, like, you know, a half day at a Colosseum to see the Colosseum of the Roman Forum, you can either look online, there's many, um, agencies uh, that will procure guides uh, that can guide you or if you know a guy a guide uh, like me you can contact me if you want directly and we can arrange it uh, directly with me <laughs> leslie lang maybe a silly question but the city is made of stone how did it actually burn my impression is that marble slash stone doesn't burn but it did how leslie it's a very good question it's not silly at all i didn't specify that when the great fire occurred the majority of the city of rome was made out of wood so they did have several story buildings so where people lived exactly as the condominiums nowadays the apartment buildings five six stories high and all of, of it made of wood and open flames were very typical because it was their source of lighting of heating up water of cooking of cleaning of everything so imagine how frequent the fires were this one was later known as the big one the great fire because of how devastating uh, it was uh, even compared to the other fires that had occurred already and that occurred for many more centuries uh, so the the monuments were were made out of stone but the the houses even the houses of the rich people were mainly made out of wood rochelle bordeaux wonderful presentation thank you rochelle just out of curiosity how many languages do you speak <laughs> i speak to two and two halves <laughs> my spanish and my french are not i'm not as fluent uh, but i you know I, I i can go by maria Elena, thank you very much for this wonderful and informative presentation. Thank you, Maria. My pleasure. Can I ask what happens to the bodies who got executed or lost in the gladiatorial fight in the Colosseum? Were they fed to the lions or was there a special grave for them? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Mass graves burning of the bodies also for health reasons mainly not because you know they like burning bodies uh, just for the sake of it and also feeding the animals uh, definitely kit hartford is there a lot of scaffolding on buildings in the city um you know there is um sometimes uh, yes because uh, they do restorations maybe you saw a couple of the pictures in the coliseum there was a big scaffolding on the outer wall because they were cleaning it so sometimes yes uh, but not i mean the city is so big it has so many monuments that it is you, you you will never find it all scaffolded you know robert blanton i lived in aviano for four years ah for the military base and want to move back to Italy for retirement. How hard is it to find housing, jobs, etc.? Well, jobs, uh, uh, it varies a lot, no, Robert, depending on the field, on what type of job, on your experience. Uh, um, housing, very easy, very, very easy to find a home in Italy. But of course, it depends on the area, but send me an email, we can talk about it. Anna Bastianelli. Please, any book suggestion on this subject? Great presentation. Um, look, off the top of my head, the author that you want to look for is Mary Beard. She's an English author. She's an archaeologist. 
I don't particularly like her style, but she's really good. She's very thorough. She wrote lots of books uh, and she also did videos for BBC, you know, and documentaries. So you might also want to um, look her up online. She, you find her on YouTube and she wrote a lot of things. Other than that, I know a lot of Italian authors, but um, nothing comes to mind in English. Another, uh, we have the last two questions. Another anonymous spectator. Do you do tours of Ostia Antica? Any good Vespa tours? Wonderful presentation. Thank you. I do tours of Ostia. Ostia, for everybody else, is the Ro Pompeii of Rome. It was the harbor city for ancient Rome. So it's an ancient city, what remains of it. Um, and it's very, way closer to Rome than Pompeii. So when you're in Rome and you don't go to Pompeii, you can uh, visit Ostia. And it's basically the same experience. So yes, I do. Vespa tours, I know there are. I've never done it. So... But if you look online, you find them for sure. Sharon Doucette, as always, a wonderful presentation, Elena. How did the Great Fire actually start? Thank you, Sharon. Who knows? Some think it was, um, it started within a shop at night, uh, you know, just uh, by accident, no arson involved, apparently. Fernando Sintora, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. You're welcome. As a sixth grade teacher in California, USA, there is so much to teach about ancient Rome, but my students always want me to cover gladiator fights and chariot races, races and anything about the Colosseum. I feel for you, Fernando. That's exactly the questions I get when I bring groups and of students in the Colosseum. Yes. I I thought that was a good place for us to end. I have a memory to share in 2016, while we were all trying to educate the tour and the tour, um, the, the group of students that we brought, where did they go, Elena? They went to the gladiator fight school to learn how to be gladiators, remember that? And that was like their best memory. Um, so, tour. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Leave the Coliseum behind, I wanna learn how to be a gladiator. Absolutely. So that brings us to the close. Thank you again. And thank you for being so patient to go through all of the questions and answering them so thoroughly. I really do appreciate it. And I know the audience does as well. If you need to reach out to Elena, um, we have shared her email. I will also share it on tomorrow's follow-up um, email so that you have a way to reach her if you'd like. And we will also share a recording of this presentation as well as a link to next week's presentation. So for now, everyone have a great day, evening, morning, wherever you are. And thank you again for showing up. And thank you, Elena, for your presentation. Take care. Have a good night.